Hi there, my name is Caitlin Bandy and this is my channel Bandy's Books. Today we are here for a review and a recipe. This is going to be my updated version of Bookish Recipes. And today we're going to basically talk about the book Olga Dies Dreaming by Zuchito Gonzalez while we cook a beef bolognese. The reason that we're going to be cooking beef bolognese is because one of the characters right here in the book creates a beef bolognese of their own. So we're going to take that little segment of that book and use that for the inspiration for our recipe. While we get into it, like I said, I'm going to be reviewing this book, talking to you about what I loved, what I didn't love, why you should read it, and also why you should cook this beef bolognese at home. Secret is that it's killer. One of my absolute favorite foods. So we want to go ahead and jump into this, but before we do, let's get a little background. Olga Dies Dreaming is about two characters mainly. Olga, the title character, and her brother Prieto. They are of Puerto Rican descent, they're living in New York City, and Olga is a wedding planner. She has become kind of famous of late, and she's doing all these like high-end wedding receptions for people that are just like the who's who's of New York City. She's been on TV a little bit. She's getting a lot of exposure, and she's really starting to, to grow. And Prieto is a, pol a politician in New York City. I believe that he's like a district representative or something like that, and he is dealing with trying to stay authentic to who he is and to serve his community and also balancing it with what he has to do to get ahead in politics. So there's that kind of tug between morality and like taking some shady backdoor deals in order to get some things done. I really loved both characters and found them super compelling and I found this book a joy. It's tough, it's sad, it's frustrating, but really interesting, covers a lot of topics that I feel like a lot of Americans should have some interest in. So definitely worth picking up. We'll just start there. And as we go through this recipe, I'm going to talk about this book some more. For our ingredients today, we're going to have about a pound and a half of ground beef, uh, heavy whipping cream, good quality beef stock, some Parmesan cheese, a white onion, red wine, preferably something a little drier, cremini mushrooms, carrots, celery, garlic, and a couple jars of your favorite tomato sauce. For me, I just happen to have some prego on hand. I'm not super like dedicated to this flavor. I will say that whatever sauce that you use, try to keep it like a not heavily flavored one. So don't get any of the ones that are like extra roasted garlic or 27 vegetables added or things like that. Just, you know, something basil garlic, something, you know, basic. It'll make a good blanket for our sauce. You'll also need three bay leaves, some thyme, some oregano, and black pepper and salt. The equipment that we're gonna need today is pretty easy. We're gonna need a cutting board, a chef's knife, a wooden spoon, and then two large pots. We're gonna use one to cook the sauce in and one to boil some pasta for dinner later. And I didn't say pasta in the ingredients, but you're gonna want your pasta of choice as well. I think today we're gonna to use, well, let's see, we have a couple pastas. I think we'll be using hamele today, but I would actually honestly recommend a pappardelle or a tagliatelle or an egg noodle. That's my favorite with bolognese. One of the things that I really loved in Olga Dies Dreaming is that Olga is kind of torn between two worlds. She has a mom who has been very absentee in her life and is very connected to the independent Puerto Rico movement. Her mom is fighting to make Puerto Rico no longer a territory of the United States to make it its own independent self-governed nation. And she really wants her kids to feel as passionate as she does. And so she puts a lot of pressure on both Olga and Prieto uh, to be more involved with Puerto Rican politics. And both Olga and Prieto, you know, they have kind of an idea of what's going on. It's not that they're unaware, but it doesn't affect them as much, I think, because they grew up here in the States, uh, not as heavily involved as their mom did with Puerto Rico and their political struggles. And I think they actually individually have kind of different opinions on where politics in Puerto Rico should go. I think they're not quite as fervent as their mom is. I think their their mother is very, she seems almost to be on the extreme, like she's willing to do whatever it takes to get Puerto Rico independence, regardless of the casualties that it causes. Whereas Prieto and Olga both seem more cautious in regards to that. But the reason that I really like this is because I find that I haven't read that many books that have uh, really explored Puerto Rico's independence and the toxic relationship that Puerto Rico has with American politics and how basically, you know, American politics has subjugated and kept Puerto Rico from really blossoming. 
there are parts in the books where we see, or in this book where we see some shady backhand, you know, under the table deals with Puerto Rican politicians and American uh, corporations. And essentially, the shady characters that we're seeing are trying to profit off of Puerto Rico, but keep Puerto Ricans poor. Uh, it's really sad. And it's something that is very realistic. Like that, that is something that goes on, not just in Puerto Rico, but all over the world where you have these mega corporations that want to exploit, you know, little countries um, or big countries, just they want to exploit countries in general for their resources and take the best of those countries and then leave the people penniless uh, and, and keep them in a, a position where they have to work for them, you know, at basically slave wages. So I really appreciated the inclusion of that topic within this book. I thought that that was a really, it was handled really beautifully. It's not the main storyline of, of the book, but it is an important storyline that does get brought up on multiple occasions. And um, I thought that that was really, you know, beautifully done and something that I wish more Americans were aware of, specifically in regard to Puerto Rico. I also love that, you know, Prieto and Olga kind of struggle with their identity and struggle with the pressure that their mom is putting on them because that is realistic to people that grow up in multiple cultures. You know, you grew up here in the States maybe, but your parents immigrated from somewhere else and you're raised in between two worlds. And you see that with them. You see that desire to connect with their mother and with her goals for Puerto Rico, but also their desire to be independent and be American and, you know, build a life over here. And at points, Olga and Prieto both seem to deal with some guilt in regards to that. I really thought that that was beautifully done characterization. Uh, another thing that I really appreciated in the characterization is Prieto is a politician and he is also a gay man and he is struggling with coming out not so much because he thinks like his family is going to disown him but more because he's worried about his politics and you really see like all the decisions that he makes in regards to his politics how they take a toll like at the end of the day his goal is to be the best person that he can be for his constituents but he keeps getting forced into situations where he has to make these like terrible choices and you see how heavily it weighs on him he isn't it isn't a black and white thing and sometimes he makes the wrong choices sometimes you see him make bad decisions and you get frustrated but then you you feel sympathy for him too because you see a person that's struggling to do the best that they can and find their way and not always like sure of what the right way is because, you know, if he says no to the shady business deal, it might prevent him from doing something else that's actually beneficial to his constituents. I thought that was really well done. had a relationship status it would be it's complicated initially when we meet olga she is kind of in a complicated situation with this older gentleman named dick dick is kind of a dick dick essentially wants olga because she's hot and young and i think to him he views her as exotic which is super creepy but it's the reality he doesn't really treat her like a human being he has no concept of if she's comfortable with him, if she's comfortable with what he's doing with her, nothing. He's just always trying to impress her with like flashy wealth and material things. And honestly, I found myself rooting the whole time for Olga to read him the riot act and then never see him again. Meanwhile, Olga meets this awesome guy named Mateo who she hits it off with instantly. You could just tell that there's chemistry. There's some trust issues there, both on Olga's part and Mateo's part. And they kind of slowly have to build a relationship with each other and learn to trust each other. And it's not always easy. Um, they're both dealing with issues and it takes them a while to kind of open up about some of those issues. But I definitely found myself rooting for them. And 
if you are a fan of you know like really getting invested in book relationships i think they're one that you'll find yourself rooting for as well so the bolognese that we're cooking today is inspired by dick unfortunately because there is one point where he knows he messed up and in order to try to impress olga he essentially decides to cook her dinner and he makes a beef bolognese. Now, I have no idea if Dick can cook a good bolognese or not. We never find out in the story either because that's not what the purpose of that particular part of the story is. But that particular part of the story is important to the narration and important to Olga making some decisions for herself and about her life and what she wants. And because it's such a pivotal point, I figured that this was a dish that we needed to recreate. This is also one of my favorite dishes. I typically make my bolognese with lamb, just a disclaimer. So when I make this at home for myself, I do us usually use ground lamb, but because in the book he specifically makes a beef bolognese, we're going to do a beef version today. So when you're making this at home, you can do whatever you want with it. You could do it with beef like we're doing, you could use ground lamb, you could do it with ground pork, you could blend two or three different types of meat, like a half lamb, half beef blend, or you could do half pork, half beef. Experiment, find what works best for you. For the purposes of today, and because of Dick's inspiration, we're going to be doing specifically ground beef. We're going to start the cooking process on our bolognese. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is actually a little bit backwards, I think, from the typical. And we're going to brown off our mushrooms first. The reason that I'm browning off the mushrooms first instead of the meat first is because mushrooms really have to get kind of dry to brown. If you put the mushrooms after the meat, they're just gonna steam. And I really like the flavor that they get from browning. So we're gonna throw in our cremini mushrooms as best as we can. And we're gonna let those cook on high heat, get a little bit of browning on them just to really enhance that nice mushroomy flavor. Now I'm using cremini mushrooms specifically. Some places you'll find that they're called baby bella. So either cremini or baby bella. If those aren't widely available, you could always chop up some portobellos, white mushrooms will work. Really whatever mushrooms you have on hand will pretty much work for this. But my preference is towards the cruminis or baby bellas. So we're just gonna get this nice and hot, get these browned off. So now that our mushrooms have some color on them, we're going to go ahead and add in our ground beef. For ground beef here. And that's what you wanna hear. You wanna hear that loud sizzle uh, because our pan is hot enough to brown everything off. I'm just gonna, gonna break up those larger chunks. And then we're gonna let this sit here and brown just a little bit. The reason we wanna brown this off is because it adds another layer of flavor. Same with the mushrooms. Generally, anytime that I'm browning anything off, I just want that extra layer of flavor that, that that browning adds. Don't worry too much about if this sticks, like you see that it's sticking a little bit to the pan. That's okay, we're gonna deglaze this pan with wine in a minute. What happens when we deglaze is all the stuff that's stuck on the bottom called the sook, it is gonna simmer off and into the sauce and create more flavor. So don't get panicky if you feel it sticking a little bit. Now that our beef is nice and browned off, we're gonna go ahead and add our remaining vegetables. So we've got onions, carrots, and celery. We're gonna just go ahead and pop that in very carefully so I don't spill it all over my stove. We're just gonna let this sweat a little bit. What sweating means is that we're not necessarily going for brown. We're just gonna let this cook down a little bit till the veggies start to release their juices and till they get a little bit tender. The reason that we're sweating versus browning in this case is that the vegetables natural juices when you let them sweat like this are going to be a little bit sweeter if you brown them they're going to have a little more depth it's kind of um just a different flavor profile so we're going to let these cook for maybe three to five minutes just until they get nice and soft and we start to see the juices coming up. our vegetables are nice and sweated as you can see the onions are starting to become translucent things are getting tender so we're going to add in our garlic now We're gonna add in this garlic and we're just gonna cook this until it's fragrant, which is about a 60 second cooking time. When I say cook till fragrant, what it means is just until you can really smell the garlic. So you kind of cook it in or stir it in 
and then you just kind of let it cook a little bit and you wait and about 30 seconds to a minute in all of a sudden the garlic smell is going to become really really powerful and fragrant and when that happens we're going to take our red wine in this case i'm just using some yellowtail cab sauv that i had on hand you could use a merlot any kind of a drier red wine we're going to hit that in here we're going to go ahead and use that whole entire bottle that might seem like a lot of wine but don't worry it's going to cook into the sauce and add so much flavor now that our wine is in we're going to bring this up to a boil and once this comes up to a boil, we're going to reduce it down to a simmer and we're going to let this reduce until it becomes thick and syrupy. That's probably going to take about 20 to 30 minutes. So cook this recipe with patience, give it lots of love. That's the way that bolognese is going to come out the best is when you're patient with it, when you, you know, have an afternoon free. This isn't honestly a dish for, you know, a rushed Wednesday night when you've got the kids and a lot going on. This is the kind of thing I would do on a Sunday when you're relaxing and you have the time. Pour yourself a glass of wine while you're cooking it. Enjoy the time, relax, enjoy the smells in the house and the comfort of that cooking on the stove. And that's gonna give you the best experience. So now our wine has reduced a bit. It's not like dry or anything, but we've reduced it down significantly. It's been cooking about 20 minutes. So we're gonna add in some good quality beef broth. And I know this might seem strange because we're going to add tomato sauce, but I swear to you, adding this broth, in my opinion, makes the sauce taste so much better. We just reduce it the same way that we're going to do with the wine or that we did with the wine. You're going to bring it up to a boil. Same thing. Cook it for 20 or 30 minutes. Let it reduce down. And then when we add the sauce, we're going to be cooking it for another couple hours. So all of this moisture that you're seeing in here right now, all of this liquid, is going to essentially evaporate and just leave all that flavor behind. So we're going to have the flavor from the beef itself, the flavor from the beef broth, the flavor from the wine, all of that mixing in with this tomato sauce. And it's just going to create these beautiful layers of flavor within this sauce and create one of the most full bodied bolognese that you'll ever have, I guarantee. And if you're watching this and you come from a family that makes bolognese a certain way, or you know, you're like, that's not my Nana's traditional recipe. I understand. There are so many variations. People come up with things, you know, they, by trial and error, what works for them might not be what works for someone else. This is just the way that I do it personally. I'm not saying that this is the right way or the only way, just the way that I like to do it the best. For me, I've made bolognese many, many times over the years. I have actually made it in several of the restaurants that I worked in and in different ways and for me i've taken all the things that i've learned over the 20 plus years in restaurants and all of the years that i've been cooking at home and kind of homogenized it down into one recipe that i really like so for me you know browning the mushrooms at the beginning and then sweating the vegetables and browning the meat and adding the red wine and adding the beef stock and the couple other tricks that i have coming further in the recipe they just create so many levels of flavor that I feel like at this point I've come up with the best bolognese sauce that I can come up with personally. Um, again, it's no critique of what anyone else does at home or, you know, I'm not saying that this is the only recipe ever. It's just like the way that I, I like to do this particular dish. And I hope that you'll enjoy it too. Genuinely, I feel very confident in this sauce. I hope that you'll give it a try and let me know what you think of it. All right, so you can see that the beef stock and the red wine has all but dried up. We're down to like the very last little bit of it. So this is the time in which we want to add our sauce. So we're going to dump our two jars of sauce in there. And mix that in. To make sure I get all of my sauce, I actually will just add a little bit of water to the jar and then shake it around so I don't miss any of it. That can go in there as well. We're gonna add in a couple bay leaves. A little bit of thyme. If you have fresh thyme, that'd be better. And oregano. Some black pepper.
and then we're gonna stir this all in, make sure that it gets incorporated. And we're gonna use this method where we're pulling up the stuff from the bottom and incorporating it into the top, just because we have all that broth and meat and everything at the bottom. You can see it's already turned our sauce nice and dark. That's from the red wine and the beef stock. And then one little trick that I have. So we have a nice block of Parmesan cheese, right? This outside edge is not something we're gonna eat. This is the waxy rind and it is not the best in terms of like grating on top or eating it as a piece of cheese. So my trick is that I put this in. So the reason that we're putting this Parmesan rind into the sauce is because it's gonna impart some flavor. So as it cooks, it's not gonna melt because it's the waxy rind. It's not gonna melt into the sauce. So it's not like an Alfredo where you put actual cheese in it and it melts and creates like a nice sauce itself. This is gonna stay at the end. We're gonna remove that piece of rind, just like we're gonna remove the bay leaves. But while it simmers in there, it's gonna give this nice umami, salty, Parmesan-y flavor to our sauce. It adds, trust me when I tell you, it adds a, just a nice layer of just something special to the sauce. So we're gonna save the rest of this cheese for shaving on top of our pasta when we serve it, of course. But that rind is gonna just add so much to the sauce. So this, now that this is all together, we have our, our broth reduced, our wine reduced, we've added our sauce and our spices. It's probably gonna cook for about another two hours, very, very slowly. So we don't want this to be bubbling rapidly. Tomato sauce can burn, this will stick. It does get ugly if you leave it on too high. So what you wanna do is you bring it all the way up to a boil where it's bubbling a little bit rapidly and then you reduce it to the point where it just very, very lightly bubbles. So just a low, low simmer. Um, probably if you're using flame, it's gonna be like a very low flame just to keep it kind of hot and give the flavors time to kind of meld together and you know give the spices time to do what they do and season. This is gonna be so good. So we're gonna go away for about two hours and let this simmer. Like I said, this is best done on a Sunday or a Saturday when you have nothing to do in the evening. You can have a glass of wine, maybe watch a movie while it cooks, really relax and enjoy yourself. So if you're trying to rush this and do this fast, it's just not gonna come out the way that you want. And while we're waiting for that to cook, let me go over the last little bit of Olga Dye's Dreaming. So this book essentially is much more character driven than it's plot driven. There is plot, there's multiple things going on. You know, there's Prieto's struggle with his politics. There's Olga's struggle with her relationship, with finding herself and being her authentic self. There's both of their struggles with their mother and the fraught relationship that they have with her. There's a lot going on, but really the focus of this book is in the characters. It's in the things that are going on in their heads, their feelings, their fears, their hopes, their dreams. You know, it's, it's really a beautiful exploration of what it means to be a 30 something year old trying to figure yourself out. And as a 30 something year old who's trying to figure myself out, I really, really related to this. I rated this book a four and a half stars. I really loved it. I got it in January with my book of the month box. And it was one of the first books that I picked up from book of the month. And I'm so happy about it. The cover is absolutely stunning. And the writing inside is just as beautiful. I highly recommend it. If you're interested in learning anything about Puerto Rican politics, anything about you know, identity, if you like exploration of characters and conflicts, it's a really, really beautiful book. If you're looking for something that's really plot heavy, very action based and moving really rapidly, this might not necessarily be the book for you. But if you really like rich, beautiful characters and exploration of deep topics, then definitely consider picking this book up. We'll be back in about two hours when this bolognese is close to finished and I'll show you how to finish it up. All right, so it's been a couple hours and our sauce is looking fantastic. I wish that I could impart the smell into the kitchen. It is so beautiful. You can see our sauce is like a nice, rich, dark color now. It's nice and thick and beautiful. So we're gonna do two things. We're gonna add a splash of heavy cream. Now, I know what you might be thinking, what the hell is heavy cream doing in a tomato sauce? Trust me. This is a trick that I actually learned recently, well not super recently, but in the last couple years. When your sauce is tasting really acidic, adding a tiny bit of heavy whipping cream into it and just stirring it in gives it a little bit of a richness and it cuts the acidity just slightly. And oh, it just makes tomato sauce so fantastic. We're not adding enough cream to turn this into like a vodka sauce or anything like this. It's not gonna be a pink sauce. It's just a little splash just take it down slightly. 
So I typically will add like three tablespoons. So we're just gonna check the seasoning. This is really good. I did add about a tablespoon of salt during the cooking process. I think my salt level is really good here, but make sure, of course, before you serve, always check your salt. And this is the beautiful color of our finished sauce. You can see that our bay leaves are floating around in there. And that is also the cheese rind that we put in there earlier. Like I said, it doesn't really melt into the sauce. It just kind of gets stringy, but it doesn't all the way break down. So you can remove that before serving or you can leave it in there. Just don't put it on somebody's plate. That is the finished sauce. So we're gonna make up a plate real quick, try our first bites, and then I'm gonna have dinner because I am starving. Voila. So this is our finished bolognese and this recipe was again inspired by Olga Dai's Dreaming by Zochito Gonzalez. This is a beef bolognese and one of my favorite dishes combined with one of my favorite reads of the year. Like I said I rated this about a 4.5. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. It's a beautiful book. Pasta and some sauce. perfection absolute perfection this is just probably one of my favorite things to make so good so if you like this video you know what to do hit the thumbs up and comment down below tell me what your favorite comfort food is I want to hear all about it and if you aren't already following my channel you know what to do hit the subscribe button I'll be back next week with another delicious recipe and a review as well as other bookish content for you to check out. Thank you so much for stopping by. Have a good night. Bye. Did I pass? Oh yeah. It's very good. <laughs> there you have it. Boyfriend approved. Second opinion. Thanks again, have a good night.